This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Awesome Chat is brought to you by Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Hey guys, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. This is an awesome chat. I know we haven't done one of these for a, a good bit, but uh, uh, we had the opportunity to talk with somebody that's uh, uh, on the forefront of what's going on today, of course, with the coronavirus COVID-19 uh, situation. And you guys are hearing about a lot of technology to try to solve that problem. And uh, uh, uh Fortunately, unfortunately, timed with a lot of things, even just here in Allegheny County and seeing a spike in numbers. I think it's really important for us to have this conversation about ways that we can help curtail th- these the situation and everything going on. So uh, joining me right now is the founder of the Novid app, uh, Poshen Lo, joining me right now. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Real pleasure to chat with you. So, so tell me a little bit first before we get into the application and and, and how it's going to help you know uh, 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 tracing and and you know seeing if you've been exposed to uh, somebody with coronavirus. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, uh, what what angle are you coming at uh, uh, for for this project? Right, I actually am just a mathematician. I mean, my background is I I do math. I'm a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I also work on education. I also happen to be the national coach of the U.S. Math Olympiad team. And so I just come from this hardcore math side, which at the beginning doesn't seem to have so much overlap. But the reason why I suddenly got involved is because a long time ago when I got my PhD, I was supported by a, a group called the Hertz Foundation. It's the same Hertz as in the Hertz rental car company. Okay. And the Hertz Foundation had a situation where they would give a few people a free PhD. Uh, but in exchange, you sign a moral agreement that says if there's ever a moment of national emergency, you'll pitch in the help. And so I'm actually one of this group. And in the middle of March, uh, there was a rallying cry that went out through, throughout this group by a very senior and distinguished member detailing how bad COVID-19 was at a time when I was one of the ignorant people who thought it was just like the flu. I actually thought it was just like the flu at that time. But once I saw that it was serious, I happened to realize that my direct area of math research called network theory was directly relevant to possibly stopping the spread of a disease that transmitted before people knew they had it. That was the moment of insight. The moment of insight was oh, this is different from all the other diseases. Two days before you have the disease, you start transmitting, and nearly half of the transmission happens while you don't know you have it. This is an enormous percentage that the nearly half of the transmission happens before you know have it. And that means that you absolutely must have a way to do what we call contact tracing today, or just any way of stopping the spread through people who might have already been exposed without knowing it. That's actually how I realized this was a fundamentally necessary thing. And in the middle of March, before anyone was talking about app-based contact tracing, I quickly pulled together a team of people uh, closely related to Carnegie Mellon University and Pittsburgh, and we ran as fast as we could and made Novit, which is now the first and still the only anonymous contact tracing app available for the United States of America. That was kind of the astonishing part for me, because I've had your app on my phone for a good long time. And, and and I can't recall how long it's been on here because I, I mean well the last three months are kind of mushed together to be quite honest <laughs> with everything going yeah. on. Um, it, it, it seen and, and I feel like this came out when we were just talking about the idea of these APIs yeah. that were being implemented in Apple and Google, who honestly have not for most of us been even fully realized as a viable option. Uh, can you tell me how quick this thing came together? It was with the with your with your concept already kind of in the head. Uh, were you kind of already halfway there for for implementation to get it out so quickly? Oh, so the actual thing that happened was that the rallying cry went out to our community saying, do something. This is a moment of not only national emergency, but international emergency. The next day, I happened to be reading the PhD thesis of my graduate student about network theory. I was supposed to give him feedback. But by the second sentence, I had this realization, this epiphany that, oh, my gosh, our area of research is what we need to stop this. 
I actually didn't read the rest of his thesis. Fortunately, he graduated. So no, no graduate students were harmed in this process. He oh, was good. a super genius. Oh, good. He was a super genius. But in any case, as soon as I realized that, I, just, I immediately started searching on the internet to find out whether the modern smartphones had the capabilities to do what I call anonymous contact tracing. Mm -hmm. This is way before anyone was talking about this stuff. And after I found out that it was possible, I... Actually, that night, I put out a call to action across all of my social media channels in Pittsburgh saying, is there anyone here who wants to work together on a solution that could legitimately stop the spread of this disease? We must get it done and fully deployed by the time that the lockdowns end and the next wave rises. So the, the time frame we were working against was the, the Pittsburgh had actually just started locking down. Allegheny County just started locking down. And we said, we have a race against time. That this cannot just be a vision. This has to be a fully deployed app that people could install that, that could be useful to interrupt the next explosion of the virus. Three weeks later, we released the first version. Okay. This was April wow. 7th, before wow. the, the other APIs you're talking about. We actually released the Android version publicly on the internet for download on April 7th. Wow. And, and, and I presume iOS not too long after that, right? iOS took one more month. Uh, uh, actually, the things that took the longest were the regulatory approval. Mm. So basically, even though we released the Android one for download, I didn't say that was the Google Play Store. Uh, the uh, Google Play Store took another month as we went and had to prove that we were not just a few guys in the garage, but we had some legitimate contribution. Especially, and of course, I think, I think both app stores were really cracking down at the time on some fake COVID related applications. Uh, so, so it was probably even, even headier uh, situation to get over with that. And, and this is, you know, uh, you know, say just a few guys in the garage idea that this is, I'm looking at the list of contributors. This is nearly 20 people. Um, I believe mo mostly uh, CMU related people, correct? I would say that more than half of the people who helped to build the core technology were CMU related people. Although we're very proud to also have as one of our very core developers, the person who built the Pat Tracker app. The Android Pat Tracker app for the buses. Oh. The, the buses, yeah, yeah, that has fifty thousand downloads in Pittsburgh. Nice. So the same guy who did the Pat Tracker app is actually one of our core uh, Android developers. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about this because everybody is familiar with you know the conversation or controversy or whatever the case may be around the APIs in 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 Google in, in uh, Google and, and uh, I'm sorry Android and iOS. Um, and of course, that is a situation where that is out there. But you know, I think four states have maybe implemented or about to a couple of countries have it's nothing that me sitting in pennsylvania can do and, and and take advantage of it's also a different core technology from what i understand too can you tell me a little bit about that you know we talk about this contract chasing you know in and uh your your network theory but what technologies on my phone is it using how does that work in practice there are two fundamental differences between what Novid does and what everything else you have heard of does. In that sense, we are very unique from, I'd say, the other 15 other apps or whatever mm -hmm. uh, are out there. And I say this with all due respect to the other, other, other efforts. I think that it's wonderful that other groups such as Apple and Google are stepping forward to try to do something here. I'm not here to criticize them. But if what you wanted to know is what do we do that's different, the easiest way to explain one of the differences is that we use ultrasound to make sure that we have accuracy. And what I mean by this is that uh, you may have heard of a lot of these Bluetooth-based contact tracing apps. The ones that use Bluetooth are based on the idea that if you have a phone, the phone can sense the Bluetooth signal strength that the other phones have coming to it. There's only one slight problem. There's not a definite way to translate between a Bluetooth signal strength and an actual distance. And the reason is because, for example, different phones transmit at different Bluetooth strengths in the first place. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there are lots of other effects that can cause the Bluetooth signal to be weaker. So actually, to this date, it still is an open research problem to convert the Bluetooth signal strength to a distance. We use ultrasound. In fact, I'm, I'm holding up one app here. I'm not sure. I don't think my, my camera here is, is good enough to capture the screen. But I have, I'm holding up an old iPhone 5S. Oh, wow. And I'm just going to... I'm going to press a button on it. Yeah, the old iPhone 5S is on purpose because we wanted to make sure that our system would work on very old devices. So this old iPhone 5S, I've just pressed the scan button. What it's doing is it's using Bluetooth to communicate with another device near me. And then that other device near me is responding with ultrasonic sounds. And I'm measuring the time it takes from the, for, for the other phone to send the signal over to here. Based on the time it takes for the sound to travel, you can guess how far away things are. Where guess is that's the same way you do it when you find out how far away thunder is, uh, light, a lightning storm is. You hmm. look for the flash and you listen for the thunder. And in fact, this thing here says, you know, seven feet, 11 inches, just a second. 
Sorry, I had to go off camera. But the other device, the other device that we had is over here. And this is not an iPhone. I'm actually just showing that we have an iPhone and we also have uh, some Android device, a Motorola G7 Play. But between these two devices, we were able to actually sense a distance with, with some level of accuracy. And now that was the first difference, that we used the ultrasound so that we can actually get these distance measurements. That's important because then you have some confidence that the contact was a close contact, as opposed to, for example, the same way your Bluetooth headphones work upstairs through the floor. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you reject those false positives, so to speak. That's difference one. Difference two is an exciting feature that we're about to roll out this week, so I'm happy to tell you about it. Um, we actually anonymously collect the full network of interactions between devices. So what I mean by this is anonymity is very important. When you install the Novid app, as you, as you noticed when you installed it, it didn't ask you for your name, your phone number, your address. It doesn't even use GPS. We no. don't know anything about you. And on the other hand, though, we're collecting this network of this device was new, not that, sorry, this, this device ID, which is some 40-digit number. It was near this, this other device ID, near this other device ID, near that other device ID. We have the whole network. The Google and Apple system intentionally doesn't collect that. That's not their fault. They actually wanted to not collect that because their model of privacy was they really want to only have that everyone only knows who was around them. Yeah. I respect that. On the other hand, the angle I came at from network theory said, if you actually anonymously, still anonymous, anonymously got this whole network, we can provide early warning to people who aren't yet sick. And so here's a paradigm shift. This is what we're going to be introducing with the new feature this week. The existing methods are all based on telling you that you might already be exposed because you might already have been near someone who was exposed. So you might already be sick. So please contact somebody or uh, isolate yourself so that you don't make anyone else sick. That's the operating model. It's based on altruism. Our model that we're about to roll out, roll out will also appeal to the selfish people who just want to protect themselves, which, by the way, is human instinct, and I respect that too. Oh, yeah. The new feature will be something which we call the COVID radar. It will tell you how far away these recent reports of COVID activity are from you based on how many degrees of separation you have along this network, the network of who you actually spend time with. Why is this relevant? This actually could be a game changer. It's because finally, we're now going to be notifying you when you're not yet infected, you're not yet sick, and we'll give you a way to try to not get sick in the first place. I'm showing that this flips the philosophy onto another angle. By the way, these, are, these can both uh, survive, these can both coexist. I'm yeah. saying that there's a, there's a room for contact tracing. Find the people who are already possibly sick and attempt to isolate them. We provide another way. Suppose you're not sick yet and you don't want to get sick. We want, everyone would like to have a weather forecast or an idea of <laughs> how close is this COVID-19 coming to them. Yeah. And with, armed with this information, everyone will be able to, at certain times, maybe not go to the bars or maybe, well, like, unfortunately, they also closed, but we, they, we would be able to have everyone know when you can take greater precaution, uh, when is a good time to take greater precaution to help protect yourself and maybe your family. But I, I'm just showing that by having this whole network, we, we can actually tell you, you know, you're starting to see COVID activity seven distance, like distance seven relationships away from you. Yeah. And maybe the next day it's six. And if the next day is five, maybe you'd actually want to use that information to just keep a little bit more distance between people when you're out there. But this automatically would create a dynamic where the spread of the virus stops. Because as the virus approaches an area in the relationship network, all the people there basically start acting very paranoid. And that actual activity would cause the viral activity to slow down. I'm basically saying this is a way for our entire county or our entire world to automatically modulate our social interactions so that we don't have to go between everybody locked down, everybody wide open, everybody locked down, everybody wide open, but rather it's that in certain communities as it's starting to spread, people automatically become careful. Mm -hmm. That's the new feature. And that is also unlocked by the difference between ourselves and the existing methods. That is exciting. Uh, by the way, I, I, so while you were talking, you may have seen me fiddling off camera here. Uh, I, I have iPhone 5S's here that we use for chat room moderation <laughs> for multiple platforms. And I threw it on there. And, and so I, I had not, I've been well locked down and not experiencing a lot of people. So I haven't run into anybody with the app to get a contact on it. And, and I, I, and as far as implementation, you mentioned about the, 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 the distance and everything. I, I just want to kind of show and demonstrate, like it actually does show like, look, there is somebody that has been, which is my other phone 
uh, that's uh, been a foot away from me that's been in con- that I've been in contact with. So ideally, and again, just kind of reiterate. So now, let's say this other phone was like you know another person that I ran into in a grocery store. So if if at some point in the next two weeks they hit this I tested tested positive button on here, I will get a notification of that anonymously. I, I it won't tell me when or where I contacted, but that I did in in the time frame, correct? Absolutely. And that's because of privacy. That's because we have a very strong commitment to anonymity. And so we actually keep that quite vague. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't, because to you, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to, we don't have to be that nosy. It doesn't really matter that it was that person. What matters is that you were within some distance. Yes. And this new feature, what the new feature will do is if you, for example, had somebody else that you happen to spend time with and, you know, that first phone marked positive, then suddenly that other person would find out somebody at distance too from them has has, has marked positive so that they will start to know that this is starting to come close to home. Uh, I should say the fact that you can see the distance is something that we chose to do to force ourselves to be brutally honest mm-hmm. about accuracy. Mm-hmm. And what you'll find is that sometimes it's not accurate. And that's because of the laws of physics. The laws of physics are such that sound has to travel. And so if you go and stick one in a big metal box, the other one's not going to find it. But that's also, also why we show that is because if you can see how accurate it is, you know in your own behavior where to put the phone. But what I'm saying is that a tool is as useful as the laws of physics that govern it. Yeah. We made it so the tool shows what it measures so that as you experiment with it, you can just find out that very small changes to your lifestyle let you use the tool more accurately. And we hope that because we happen to put this on the front screen, we hope this causes all other app makers to also be brutally honest about what they're delivering. Because something that bothered me was, what if people are all told to install an app that doesn't do anything? Mm-hmm. We actually need to know it does something, and the easiest way to know it does something is just a display. So uh, let, let me. So for from what I understand with the iPhone, it, it was a little bit of concern about implementation personally uh, on the iPhone side. I'm sure it's different on the Android. Now, in order for this to work uh, in practice, the way I understand it, let's say I go to the grocery store where I'll obviously be around a lot of people. Uh, this will not work if I turn the phone off. You're, you're, it's, it's not actively running, right? Uh, if you have your lock screen on or whatever. But what it does um, is you're, you go into your mode. It's kind of got a faux lock screen going on here that gives, is that an accurate kind of? That is a very accurate description of what we did from design. Yes. So it will darken it. It's kind of like when you're playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, and uh, it's where it will, um, um, your, your screen will go dark, but it is still active. Your, your, sc- your phone is not locked. It is still scanning in the background. Like, you know, so it's safe to say put in your pocket while you're doing your yes. grocery shopping, correct? Yes. Okay. We actually specifically researched the lock screen to go and find out how could we deliver whatever you wanted from the lock screen mm-hmm. in a way that it's just a slightly different habit, but it protects you. I love even to the point where it's a, it's a very Android-y thing where you, you, you press on the logo, hold it down to kind of unlock into the app. <laughs> so uh, I thought it was pretty fantastic. Now, does this operate differently on the Android? Is it a more persistent or does it kind of behave in the same way? Because of the on the Android, it's completely persistent. Okay. And in fact, our, our goal is that on the iPhone, it would be persistent too. To be yeah. perfectly honest, this is not a technical limitation. This is a policy limitation by yes. the people at Apple. Yes. And what we hope is that as the world finds out that this actually is a pretty good solution that today could actually save tens of thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of lives today, if we had the clearance to do what we're doing in Android on mm-hmm. I- iOS, we could actually contribute right now. So uh, let me let me ask about kind of implementation, like how, how effective, how how widespread does this application need to be in order to to be effective? Now I feel uh, probably my own biases, but I feel like if I went to a tech conference right now, I'd be a lot safer, or at least a lot more informed using this app than uh, my my grocery my my local Walmart say um, for demographic. Like I, I mean, obviously. I'm somebody that's up on technology. I, I downloaded your app like the first week it was on iPhone because that's what I follow. Uh, you know, how much, how widespread does it need to get to be an effective way to curtail this? So I'm actually doing that research right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where I come from the network theory side. Okay. But I, I will say 
what made me realize that this was useful is that the amount of usage that this model of the early warning radar needs in order to be useful, the percentage we need is far, far less than the percentage needed for the one that only tells you when you're right next to the other person. Okay. It's because the network has redundancy. The point is that there are many different pathways of infection to come to you from somebody who is six relationships away. Okay. And because of those many different pathways, there are many different opportunities for that signal of there was a positive test to propagate to you. So all it needs to do is hit that one person that is in the network. So this is how I thought about it. So this is not here. Here I'm telling you some preliminary mathematical analysis. Sure, I'm sure. Gonna, I'm going to use some very simple numbers that please, actually can get the Please point dumb it down for me, please. No, 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 <laughs> no problem. But the, so, so here's the idea, right? Uh, what we are trying to do with the new feature. That's why the new feature is so important. Mm -hmm. The new feature is trying to give you early warning through your radar that yes. COVID-19 is coming around. So now here's how to think of it. We actually want to live in a world where we can go out again. That's actually what we're trying to build. We're trying to build something so that you can go out again yeah. because it's actually unsustainable to assume that every member of our society has to be locked in. It's actually not possible. So now, suppose that in the typical course of your normal interactions, you'd be within transmittable contact distance. Like you'd be like in, able to transmit to, let's say, 10, 10 to 20 people. Let's just assume that over the course of every two weeks, you typically would run into about 10 or 20 people yeah. that you could have transmitted it to. That actually seems reasonable. Now, suppose that just 10% of them have the app installed. 10%, that's a tiny percent. Yeah. Then that means that you, on the course of your two weeks, would run into somebody, like one or two people who had the app installed. That's enough to get this explosion of the network connecting together. Because, for example, if you have about two people who are connected to you, each of them is going to have about two people that's connected to them. Each of them is going to have about two people connected to them. You see, the, it's the explosion. It's like the times two, times two, times two, times yeah, two. Yeah. The same as the explosion of COVID-19. And so our first observation is probably at around a 10% install rate, if you went out into life sort of the way we were trying to go out before, your app in the new version would show that you are linked in with this network that has basically like a, a lot of the people who are using the app in Pittsburgh. Just because of the fact that you're linked in with more people and more people and more people and more people. Why is that important? The reason that's important is because COVID-19 is not something that only strikes one person. We mm. unfortunately had 90 cases at some point. I think it was on Saturday. If out of those 90 cases, 10% of them had the app, that's nine cases. That's already nine signal points. Yeah. What I mean is that you would, on your radar, your radar would already pick up. There are nine blips and your radar would have the link. You, you would be linked to them somehow because of this explosion of each person is linked to two people, linked to two people. This is not scientific. In fact, I'm still trying to do the mathematical calculations to try to and, and the simulations to see how rigorous this is. But that first insight is that at a very low install rate, you already would be able to see information coming at you from this radar. And what we hope is if people say, oh, if that's all we need, if they convince the people around them that they're living with or that they're working with to install, saying all you needed was 10%, well, that's usually what we need to get a snowball going. If, yeah. if, when you tell people you need 60% before it's going to work, people say, well, I'm, I'm not going to start. But if you yeah. tell people, well, at 10%, you can link up and watch. If you join, then my network gets bigger and your network gets bigger. Pretty soon, you not only have 10%, but you have 30%. And then once you have 30%, everyone says, well, clearly, this is where we're going. And then 30% becomes 60%. And then you have actually complete coverage, basically, in Pittsburgh. That, that is reassuring because I, I, the feeling is I'm an early adopter on a thing that not many people are going to get into because of that, you know, that barrier of entry of, you know, knowing it, technology awareness. Right. So 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 you are doing something by putting this on by being a fine technical listener to this very podcast. <laughs> Correct. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Excellent. So uh, we mentioned the APIs, uh, you know, while they are different and, and, and effectiveness is in question of, of the, the APIs we hear about on iPhone and, and Google. Uh, uh, is there any plans to integrate that in some way with this to maybe benefit grow that footprint? Oh, we are always actively investigating this. Mm -hmm. So actually, even earlier today, I was on a call with somebody else who helps to advise the people at Apple and at Google about how they do things. And my stance is I'm actually still a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. um, I got into this not to make a product to sell to companies. We still haven't gotten a single company client um, because that's not what we were trying to do. We were trying to just stamp out COVID-19 worldwide. 
And if it turns out that it's actually possible to effectively collaborate with Apple or Google, uh, informing the development of their technology, and also in return, being able to participate by making an app like this available to the world, then actually I'll be, I'll be all in. Um, our situation is that we, we just have, we have a history of coming up with different ways that are proving to be very effective. For example, we were the first to come up with this ultrasound idea. I actually now know through the grapevine that other people who originally started with Bluetooth are now starting to follow the ultrasound idea. So, but I, I'm very proud to say that originated in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, at this particular small outfit. And we would like to be able to have the opportunity to continue to bring these kinds of innovations to the table. But the only way to do that is if we are able to make an app. Uh, and as I've just talked about with this new radar that we want to roll out, we want to be able to roll out that radar, not only to tell people, hey, this is a good idea. Could somebody please roll out the radar? What differs, what makes us different from a lot of the other think tanks is that we actually aren't happy just telling people this might be a way to do a solution. We actually have the design skills and the implementation skills to go and make something that if a if 100 million people decided to use, they could. Uh, and we, we want to be able to continue to deliver at that forefront for the one reason that, well, if we hadn't done this, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now that while the United States is seeing this huge surge, there's a hope, right? I can tell you right now, there's a hope. There's an app. It exists. It can be downloaded. It can support 100 million people using it. And it, support, it exists today. And if, I had only, if the only way we worked was to tell people, could someone please try to do something like this? Mm -hmm. Right now, I'd probably be just as hopeless as a lot of other people saying, it looks like we got no hope. We may as well give up. That is not true. It is because we run this that we think that there is completely a hope. And in fact, we actually should actively be doing something now before it gets really out of control. Wow. I think that's a, that's a, good, that's a good thought to, to end this on here. Uh, so it's the Novid app. It's in your app store. Google and uh, iOS App Store. Go download it. Put it on all your phones. <laughs> all of your put it on your family's phone. <laughs> I want to put it on my mom's phone uh, uh, this weekend uh, for Fourth of July. Uh, so um, and and of course, uh, uh, is there any, any uh, website or anything for people that want to find out more information about this other than uh, getting into the app itself? Uh, you could go to novit.org if you're curious. But the app is designed in a way that it's supposed to be very easy to understand. Fantastic. So, so how's your how's your lockdown months been to you? I mean, I mean you've been feverishly working, of course, but uh... <laughs> uh, I would actually say that the lockdown months for me were giving me a very strong sense of urgency. Early mm -hmm. in the lockdown, as I was driving through the city, because I had to buy some devices, I had mm -hmm. to buy some devices on on Craigslist in order to test all of this. Yeah, and yeah. it was just shocking to me to drive down a city in Pits uh, down, drive down a street in Pittsburgh at eight or nine p.m. and have no cars. Yeah, I mean that was that was depressing. I, I never expected that in my lifetime I would see something like this. And that's what motivated our whole team to work. We worked until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. many nights just because we knew that we had to get this thing out because there would be another surge. And we had to make this ready in time or else we'd be back into this, this situation again. Excellent. Hey, Potion Low, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, helping everybody learn a little bit uh, uh, more about what you guys are doing. Guys, please download it and uh, and please follow everything else that's going on there and keep up on this. You know, we're talking about the technology week to week on the Awesome Cast podcast. So please tune in, uh, subscribe to the podcast on your uh, 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 podcatcher, whatever that, whatever that may be. And of course, video versions of this are available on the Facebook and YouTube page for Awesome Cast. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you to our awesome audience thank you to our awesome guest have an awesome week this show is a member of the sorgatron media podcast network find out more at sorgatronmedia.com